is a very special day for us. We're going to share the Lord's Supper together uh, toward the end of our service today. I hope you uh, got your Lord's Supper element as you came in. Hold on to it. I'll bring that to your attention a little bit later. Uh, if you didn't, we'll have another opportunity for you to get those toward the end of the service. But if you have your Bible with you this morning, would you open your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Uh, we're going to look at verses 17 through 32. And I want to talk to you this morning about the body and the blood. You know, when you think about having a dinner with someone, usually when you have a dinner with someone that you care about, it's a very intimate experience. Probably most of us, the person that we're sitting next to here today, if we're married, uh, we, we maybe the first date we had with that person was a dinner date. Often we take someone that we care about out to dinner and we have intimate conversation and we build fellowship. And when you think about having dinners, they're, they're usually intimate experiences. As a matter of fact, as I think about my family and I think about Thanksgivings and Christmas and I think about Easter and I think about so many of the times that we get together and some of the times that I remember are the times sitting around the table eating dinner together as a family and laughing and, and sharing stories and, and those are some of the most precious memories that, that I possess. Dinner together, eating together, intimate experiences. Well, the most intimate meal ever shared took place in an upper room on the night when Jesus Christ was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. It was on that night that Jesus shared his last supper with his disciples and he talked with them about his body in his blood. He shared with them in, in a very intimate way what he was about to do for them so that they could be reconciled with God and have eternal life. In our text today, as we continue our study of the New Testament, looking at the book of Corinthians, Paul corrected the K K Corinthian believers in their misunderstanding about the Lord's Supper. And he admonished them to take the Lord's Supper in the right manner. He said there is a certain way that we should take the Lord's Supper. And so the main thing I want to share with you today as we look at God's Word is, is that it's important to remember what Jesus Christ has done for you. It's very important for us to remember that often. And so would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word and let's look at these words of Paul together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 17. He said, But in following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? And humiliate those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? I shall, shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed. He took the bread. And when he gave thanks for it. He broke it and said. This is my body which is for, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way. Also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself... And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks 
judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some of you have died. But if we judge ourselves, truly we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for our salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his body and his blood, for his great sacrifice. And it is always an honor and a joy for us to share communion together, for us to take the Lord's Supper. But Father, as we read in the Word today, it's important that we do it in the right manner. And so God, I pray that you would speak to our heart today, teach us, give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So indeed, it is important to remember what Jesus has done for you and, and one of the most intimate ways that we remember what Jesus has done for us is when we share communion together, when we take the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is one of the two ordinances of the New Testament church. There are only two things that the Lord has ordained that we as believers should do. Number one is we should be baptized. The Bible says that at the moment that we put our faith in Jesus, we're saved by grace through faith, that we should follow that with believers' baptism. Believer's baptism is the way that we make a public testimony of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we identify symbolically as with his death, burial, and resurrection. As we go under the water, it's a picture of death. Like Jesus died and was buried, we die with him by faith. We die with him. Our sins are buried with him. And, and when we come up out of the water of baptism, it's a beautiful picture of resurrection. That just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too have been raised to new life. We have a new life in Christ by our faith in Him. Baptism is commanded. It is not an option for those of us who believe. If you're truly a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you obey the Lord in believer's baptism. And that's the first ordinance of the New Testament church. And then the Lord's Supper is the second ordinance ordinance of the New Testament church. We get to share the Lord's Supper often in remembrance of what the Lord has done for us. And it's important that we understand it and we take it in the right manner. So there are three things I want to share with you about the Lord's Supper today as we think about the body and the blood of the Lord. Three things. Number one, the Lord's Supper is not to be misunderstood. It has been misunderstood by many throughout the ages. And Paul here is correcting the Corinthians for the way they took the Lord's Supper. You know, in the early days of the New Testament church, they didn't have buildings. Think about it. They didn't have church buildings. We have this beautiful building we get to come to every week. We get together. They didn't have that. So the early church often would meet weekly, and they would have what was known as an agape feast or a love feast. They would meet in someone's home, they would bring food, they would share that food, and it was a way that they could minister to the needy, they could care for the poor, they could show the love of the Lord to each other, and they would have intimate fellowship, they would often read the Bible, read the scripture, and, and then they would end that agape feast by communion. They would share the Lord's Supper together and remember the death of the Lord. And so that was something that the early church did, and it was an intimate time. It, it was a beautiful agape feast. But we see that at the church at Corinth, there began to be abuses of the agape feast. Paul, as we read in verses 17 through 22, he said, there are divisions among you. And so, so when they gathered in homes for the agape feast, there were cliques. There were the haves, there were the have-nots, and the haves tended to click together and the haves not were kind of left out. Clickishness in the church is always an ugly and horrible thing. There should never be division and clickishness, but there should be a common love that we share and make sure that everybody in our body feels that love. We should go out of our way to make sure that everybody feels that love. Not only was there clickishness, but there was selfishness in the church at Corinth. Because we see that he said, some of you, he said, you bring your food. Some of you, when you come together, he, he said, look at it, verse 20. He said, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And one goes hungry and another gets drunk. So for, for those that had the ability to have food... 
they would go ahead and eat all their food. They wouldn't share it with those that had needs. And those that didn't have food would go without. And not only would they eat their food before they would share it, but they would even drink to the point of becoming inebriated and getting drunk. And so there was cliquishness, there was selfishness, there was drunkenness to the point that Paul said, you're not even eating the Lord's Supper. You may call it that. You may call it that. You may think it's that. But what you're doing has nothing to do with what Jesus Christ did on that night before he was betrayed. You see, I think somehow in their mind, they thought that as long as they took the Lord's Supper and called it the Lord's Supper, it didn't matter what they did before that, they were saved, right? Because they were taking the Lord's Supper. In many ways, that era of the Corinthian church is carried on for many years. For many, they think that if you go through the rituals of religion, the rituals of religion, it doesn't matter how you live or how you act. And that is so, so contrary to New Testament faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, new, the, the, the Lord's Supper has been misunderstood and abused for many years. The Roman Catholic Church, for instance, has a doctrine that is referred to as transubstantiation. It's a big word. If you play Scrabble, It's 18 letters. You might want to remember that word, transubstantiation. It might win you a game. That's a big word. What does transubstantiation mean? Well, gotquestions.org gave a very good summary of that. It says the Roman Catholic Church teaches that once an ordained priest blesses the bread of the Lord's Supper, that it is literally transformed into the actual flesh of Christ. And when he blesses the wine it is actually transformed into the actual blood of Christ. Therefore, the Lord's Supper is viewed as a sacrament through which God's grace is conveyed to an individual. The Bible, in contrast, tells us that grace is not given through outward symbols. No ritual is necessary for salvation. Grace is the blessing of God freely given to the undeserving. And so, beloved, that means that, that those who have a misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper think when they take the bread, that somehow that bread literally transforms into the literal body of Christ. And when they take the fruit of the vine, that that fruit of the vine literally, as you drink it, is transformed into the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, The grace of God is imparted to you as a sacrament that is administered by the priest. And therefore, every time you take the Lord's Supper, your sins are actually forgiven at that point. You see, you can imagine the abuses that come when you have that view of the Lord's Supper. Think about the power of the priest. If he he is the only one that can administer the Lord's Supper then he can, he can either give you salvation by letting you take the Lord's Supper or he can withhold salvation from you by not letting you take the Lord's Supper. That puts salvation in the power of the priest. Also, so many who view the, that, that grace is imparted by communion think that, well, I can just live however I want to live. I can do whatever I want to do, and then I can confess my sin, and I can take the Lord's Supper. And every time I take it, God's grace is imparted to me. So, hey, I can just live with a license to sin, and then just go take the Lord's Supper, and I will be saved. And there are many that live that way. You know they do. And, and there could be nothing that is further from the truth. Well, you say, well, why do the... Why do they believe that about the Lord's Supper? Well, didn't Je- that the reason they believe it is didn't Jesus say, this is my body broken for you? Didn't he say that this is my blood shed for you? So it is literal. Well, if you go to John 10, 9, Jesus said, I'm a door. <laughs> he said, I'm the door of the sheepfold. Did Jesus literally mean that he became a door? No. He's speaking figuratively. He's speaking 
uh, about his body because of what he was about to do for us. His body was about to be nailed to a cross. He was about to go through torture. And he said, this is my body. And this bread is a picture, an image of my body as I break it. I'm reminding you of what I'm about to do for you. It is my grace. And, and, And he said, as you drink this cup, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. It wasn't literally the blood of Jesus that transformed into his blood, but it was a picture and an image and symbolic of his blood. It was a picture of his grace. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7, the Bible says, When the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs to the hope of eternal life. Beloved, we are saved only by grace, not by any ritual. There is no ritual of religion that will ever save a lost soul. No ritual. It is purely by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is not something that imparts grace, but it's something that reminds us of the grace of God that we already have as believers in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every time we share the Lord's Supper, it's not that at that moment grace is imparted. It's at that moment we remember and we appreciate with humble hearts the grace of God that he has given to us. Some believe that if it literally becomes the body of Christ, transubstantiation, if it literally becomes the blood, that that means that Jesus is crucified and sacrificed over and over again. And beloved, Scripture tells us that cannot be. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, the writer of Hebrews said, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. Here it is. Once for all, having obtained eternal salvation. What Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, when he gave his body, to be tortured when he shed his blood for our salvation. Can I tell you this? According to Scripture, it was once and for all. It never needs to be repeated again. He did that for you once and for all, for your eternal salvation. In the upper room, that night before he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples, Luke twenty two nineteen. 19, Luke tells us, He took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, and he said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The proper understanding of the Lord's Supper. It's not something that we do so that grace is imparted. It's something that we do to remember, to remember what Jesus did so that we already have been saved by grace through faith. The Lord's Supper is not to be misunderstood. Secondly, the the Lord's Supper is to be shared, as we just read, as a memorial. It's a memorial. It's a memorial service. Every time we share the Lord's Supper, it's a memorial. We remember in a very intimate way what the Lord has done for us. You know, when someone who's young dies a violent death... It's not something you usually want to remember. It's something you want to forget. So why do we want to remember the violent death of Jesus? Why is it something to remember? Let me give you three things that that, that we remember about the death of our Lord Jesus. Number one, the death of Jesus was voluntary. He he gave his life for us. They didn't take it. He he voluntarily gave it away. He, he, He died for you because he wanted to. Can I say it a better way? He died for you because he loves you. He loves you. He died for you because he cares about you and he wants you to be reconciled to God the Father. There it tells us in our text, Paul said there in verse 29, For I received 
from the Lord what I delivered to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread when he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Notice it was the night he was betrayed. He knew what Judas was about to do. He knew that he was about to be betrayed. In the garden, right after the Lord's Supper, the soldiers came for Christ. They came to arrest him. They came to take him through a fake trial and to crucify him. And when they came to take him, he did not put up a fight. Peter did. (laughs) Peter, the impulsive disciple, pulled out his sword and wanted to fight. And he actually cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. And Jesus took the ear and put it back on the guy. That's a side note for you. And Jesus said this. He said, put your sword away, Peter. In Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said... Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Over 12,000 angels that that God would have provided had Jesus said, save me. Could Jesus have been saved from the cross? Absolutely. Why did Jesus go to the cross? He was constrained to go by his love for you. He knew the only way that you could ever go to heaven, the only way that you and I could ever be saved, was for him to go to the cross. It was voluntary. The second thing about Jesus' death is it was substitutionary. He died in our place. Notice he said, this is my body that is broken for you. I mean, those two words are the most precious words in the Bible. For you. This was done for you. I did this for you. You could put your name right here in the text. He did this for Bill. He did this for Tom. He did this for Jane, for John. He did this for you. Jesus Christ was crucified for you. He died in your place. The beating that was on his back, he was beaten for you. The nails that went in his hand, he took those nails for you. The crown that he wore was a crown that he wore for you. So that you could be saved. The Bible says in Isaiah 56, 53 verse 6. That all we like sheep go astray. We've all turned our own way. But God laid on him the sins of us all. When Jesus died on the cross. Whose sins did he die for? Not any that he had ever committed. He died for my sins and your sins. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated his love toward us in that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were undeserving and sinful, Christ died for us. His death was substitutionary. He died so that you wouldn't have to die and spend eternity separated from God. The the third thing about his death that makes it something to remember is that his death was temporary. (laughs) Hallelujah. His death was not permanent. He died. He really did die. I mean, he, he completely died. And they put him in a tomb, but that tomb could not hold him, right? Three days after his death, up from the grave, Jesus Christ arose. You see, today, Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is alive. He's at the right hand of the Father right now. He knows you. He loves you. He intercedes for you. His eyes are on you. He is alive. And and his resurrection to eternal life guarantees our resurrection to eternal life if we put our faith in him. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, if Christ is not risen... If he is not risen, our preaching is empty, and our faith is empty. Verse 20, but Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so we remember today that his death was voluntary. He volunteered to die for us. His death was substitutionary. He died in our place so that we could be saved. And praise God, his death was temporary. We serve a living Christ and the same resurrection that he has he offers you and I the last thing the Lord's Supper is not to be misunderstood it is a memorial third the Lord's Supper is to be taken in the right manner he went on to say to the Corinthians he he, he said 
Whoever therefore eats the bread, verse 27, and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Before you take the Lord's Supper, you need to examine yourself and then eat it. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and the blood drinks judgment upon himself. That is why he said many of you at Corinth have become sick because of God's judgment on your disrespect of the Lord's Supper. And some of you have even committed the sin unto death because you have disrespected the memorial of the Lord's Supper. What is the right manner of taking the Lord's Supper? Is it, does it mean that before I take the Lord's Supper, I, I better not have any sin in my life? Well, certainly not. Because <laughs> none of us would ever be able to take the Lord's Supper, right? Because the very meaning of the Lord's Supper is we are forgiven. But what, what is the manner of taking the Lord's Supper? It's one of humility. It's one of realizing that it's not anything that I have done. It's not by works of righteousness, but it's by His grace that I have been saved. It's one of humility. It's one of sincerity. I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. But I don't use that as a license to see. And I sincerely love my Lord. I sincerely believe in Him. I sincerely want to live for Him. It's one of humility, it's one of sincerity, and perhaps most of all, it's one of gratitude. Oh, the gratitude of what Christ has done for me. We must never forget it. We must always remember the sacrifice. We must always remember that He suffered and He took our sins. And and we must always have a heart of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 and 10, here, here's the attitude. Paul, who was a very godly man, said this. He said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I once persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I love those words. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Where would you be if it wasn't for the grace of God? For me, I'd probably be dead. I had a wonderful friend, Danny Mosley, who lived uh, many years of his life running from God, living a life of sexual sin, homosexuality. When his parents died, he came to me, and he was a broken man. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said to Danny, I said, Danny, you need the Lord. He said, but you know the life that I've lived. And I said, Danny, God loves you, and he will forgive you. And he said, but you know who I am. I said, Danny, you don't have to have sex. Nobody makes you have sex. He says, you mean all I've got to do is turn away from sexual immorality? I don't have to change my temptations. I said, no, none of us are responsible for what we're tempted to do. He said, I can do that. In my office, he opened his heart to Jesus Christ. And I said, Danny, I said, now I have this thing that meets at Cracker Barrel every Friday morning at 6 o'clock. It's called a discipleship group. And I said, I want you to start coming. And so Danny, you know him, he, he had no legs because his diabetes and other things so he would come in every morning at 6 a.m. to crack a barrel and begin to walk through the Bible. I said, Danny, at some point when you feel comfortable, you're going to want to share your testimony with our group. It took him about eight months, <laughs> I think, to feel comfortable enough with the group to share his testimony. And that day in our D-Life group, we were asking the questions about 1 Corinthians 15. One of the ones that we'll ask next week if you're in a D group. And the question is, where would you be if it wasn't for the grace of God? And and I I shared my story of where I'd be. And I saw Danny's hand start trembling. And I started praying because I knew what was coming. And Danny opened up and began to share his story. And, And I watched the eyes of the men in our group as he shared his story. And he shared about his salvation. 
And I kid you not, some of you were there. You'll remember, spontaneously after Danny shared his story, the men at the table got up out of their seat, walked over to Danny, laid their hands on him, and began to pray over him right there at Cracker Barrel. I don't know what the rest of the people in Cracker Barrel thought was happening, but I thought it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And Danny wept like a baby. And and that day, not only did did Danny share his testimony, but but I saw that Danny understood what the Lord's Supper is all about. The the humility that he lived with, the, the gratitude that he lived with every day for the grace of God. As far as I know... Danny never went back to his old lifestyle, but he found that the love of the body of Christ was sufficient for him. And he found his community here, and he found everything that he needed in his relationship with God. Danny went home to be with the Lord last year with COVID. You know that. And I praise God that my friend today has two new legs. He has functioning kidneys. He might even have hair on that bald head of his, right? That's the grace of God. And that is for which we are always grateful. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. Not so that we receive grace, but we take the Lord's Supper because we remember the grace that we've already been given and we're grateful for what Christ has done for us. Where would you be if it were not for the grace of God? In what ways do you show your gratitude to Him? Are you showing it? Could we bow our heads? Could we take a few minutes to meditate before God? In a moment, we're going to share communion together, but we want to do it in the right manner. And if you're here and you didn't receive the Lord's Supper elements when you came in, if you'll raise your hand, we've got some guys that will be sure you get that. Just while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just slip your hand up. We'll be glad to get it to you. The Lord's Supper is only for believers. It's not for an unbeliever because this doesn't impart grace. It is remembered the grace that we've already received. And and, and maybe you've never taken the Lord's Supper because you've never been saved. Today could be that day. Right now, I want to give you the opportunity to put your faith in Jesus Christ. As you remember what He did for you, that He took that suffering, His body was broken for you, His blood was shed for you, that if you would believe in Him, if you would repent of your sin and believe in Him, you would be saved. And if you've never been saved, if you've never taken Christ as your Savior, you could do that right now. He's in this very room. He knows you and He loves you. If today you would like to be saved and have the gift of eternal life and you would want to be reconciled to God and you say, that's me, would you pray this prayer with me right now and mean it in your heart? Dear Jesus, I need you. I don't want to live another day without you in my life. I thank you so much that you died for me on that cross. You did it for me. Your body was broken for me. Those nails, that crown of thorns, that cat of nine tails you were beaten with, that, was, that was, should have been for me, and you took it for me. That blood of yours, that royal blood that was shed, that was shed for me. That blood is the only thing that can ever wash away my sins. And today I believe it. And today I turn away from my sin. I put my faith in you, and I receive by faith your gift of eternal life. Beloved, with heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, praise God. It's the greatest day in your life. Today you have been born again into the family of God. And I want to invite you in just a moment to take your first Lord's Supper. You now can take this remembering what Jesus did for you. If you didn't receive that element when you came in and you, you want to take it now, just slip your hand up. We've got, we've got guys that will take it to you, bring you the elements. Slip your hand up high. If this is your first Lord's Supper, slip it up high. For those of us who have already been saved, how do you take the Lord's Supper in the right manner? Humility, sincerity, and gratitude for all that God's done for you. Would you thank Him? 
Would you thank him with an humble heart? The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. Let's open the element, the first seal. And you'll find under the first seal is the wafer. I'm going to pray and ask God to bless it. And after I pray and we bless this bread, let's eat it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ and what he went through so that we could be saved. Bless this bread as we eat it in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Very carefully, hold steadily your cup and pull off the next seal. And look at the juice. This juice represents the blood of Jesus. It reminds us of the great sacrifice that he made so that my sins and yours could be forgiven. It says, in like manner, he took the cup. Let's bless this cup. Heavenly Father, thank you for this cup of the new covenant, the new promise that you made, that for all who believe in Jesus, we will be saved and have eternal life. We thank you that we are reconciled to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can wash away our sin with the blood of Jesus. We pray that you bless this cup as we drink it in remembrance today. In Jesus' name. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Mm, Wow. Oh, what a joy. What gratitude. If you took the Lord's Supper for the first time today, I I, I pray it's an experience you'll never, ever forget. After the disciples shared that communion together, Jesus said, As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. (laughs) Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that our Lord Jesus Christ is living and he's coming. He's coming again. And we look forward to the day he comes again for his church. And then they sang a hymn. And I can only imagine the, the, the emotion with which they must have sang that him that day. So beloved church, I invite you to stand together and let's sing together with with humility, with sincerity, and with gratitude in our hearts for all that God has done for us.